So ready? I have that open. <laughs> Tell me when to go. Yeah, always. I'm ready. I've been ready. How is it going? Yes. She don't ever tell me. Lights, camera, action. I told you I had you making that terrible face. The lens face. is fogging up again. Blue tail is a homestead necessity. I do a video of this, what, two weeks ago? Yes. We had some young boys. Um, we kind of do some farm educating, farm educating, farm educating, anyway. We try <laughs> to teach some boys how to do some practical stuff, not just limited to boys, that's just what we have now. Um, just the younger generation on how to do just practical skills, because um, there's one thing we learned, uh, not many people know how to do anything. So, that video didn't come out exactly right. I can't remember why, but we didn't didn't release it. Um, it's because we it. changed our process and method halfway through. Yes, that's what it was. Um, so anyway, this is just a little short one. These birds are a little small. Um, they're just normal Catornix quail, but we have the My Shire Farm ones in the house that are growing out, and basically these were in that same house, and we needed to separate them, so we have um that breeding stock um separate from everything else so that we can put them in the breeder pen so these are destined for uh being canned or freezer camp so we're going to kind of show you the process we use um we did start doing it the way we do chickens which is using cones these are too small um but we figured out something that works but we do um slit the throats just like you do chickens to have them bleed out because in my opinion the Katornix have a little more of a livery taste which means there's usually a lot of blood in the meat so we thought this would help uh, combat that by doing it this way it's a little slower than just cutting the heads off but um, seems to be a little less uh, I don't know if it's less stressful on the bird but it seems better so that's what we're going to be doing today I'm just doing a handful of birds by myself so very similar to the same chicken processing method that most people use. Sometimes you get uncooperative customers. And it's pretty calm in there. Um, what you want to do is you want to cut the jugular vein, preferably on both sides. Sometimes that's a little difficult, but you want to not cut the windpipe. I do is I just kind of stretch them out and see right there about where their ears at and because the feathers grow up I kind of brush the feathers down at right the base of the neck Some of you won't like this process, but we don't have all the animals around here. We're not a a pet farm. Um, we do do this to supply our family with good, healthy meat. So we know where it was, what it ate its whole life from start to finish. That means a lot to us, and plus it's taking responsibility For our own food, which gives you some pretty good freedom. It's pretty empowering to know that you can feed your own family if you can't get stuff from the store. And as I said in the other video, um, we did do some plucking. See if it was worth it. And that one dropped. Yeah, I raised the board up too much. 
that's the convulsions. I'm sure if any of you are into the homesteading type of stuff, you know that even after they're expired, that the uh, convulsions continue. Just gonna kind of do it assembly line fashion as I get a cone empty, everything going. Because I have a million other things to do today other than this. So like I was saying, we did do the plucking thing, um, and that seemed to be not worth all the effort. And my wife likes to can these. You can fit five of them in a quart jar, by the way, in our pressure canning stuff. Wish I think they did some videos on that. Oh, I ain't done it in a week and I've already forgot. So we'd normally go ahead and cut the feet off. Should be right at the joint. Shouldn't feel a whole lot of resistance. The uh, wings. And the neck, I do pull the skin back enough to be able to get it so you don't end up with quite as many feathers on the meat. And get right at that joint, same thing. And you can see this one's got a, a bruise, really from when we caught them this morning. First time we ever used the Fisker scissors, they work quite well. They've got an integrated sharpener right there in the sheath, which we haven't used yet, but we like the idea of. And the only part of the cornice that's hard to do is right here at the back. That skin is pretty firmly attached. But you don't need it real, real clean because of the next step. And this is the most efficient way we've found to do this. I'm sure somebody out there in YouTube land has figured out a faster, better, easier way. But this is what we've always done works for us. You always, all the way down to the pelvis. Then you do an angle cut. Make sure you're not cutting any guts. Try to cross there. I got the oil sack a little bit. Go away. If you take your finger and put it right in along the, you can kind of feel the back of the breastbone, it's very smooth. And see, and then every time it comes out nice and clean. And the lungs even come out clean on that one. And I have cold water with some sweet gum seasoning. That's a joke. Um, or after is we just want to cool the bodies off. It's still summer here. It's a cooler day because of the hurricane, but it's still very hot in North Carolina. So we want to get the carcasses cool as quick as possible. We're hoping the uh, my shire birds are significantly larger than the traditional Katornix we've been raising. And people always comment on how small the, the Katornix are, and they are small birds. But from our experience, I can't eat but about more than two myself. I'm a pretty light eater. Um, most people that make comments of that eat more than they should anyway, but we'll let that alone. But they're extremely efficient. Every eight to ten weeks, depending on like, it, we prefer to let them grow till ten weeks. That seems to be a better size. These birds here are probably about eight weeks, um, so they're a little smaller than what we normally do. But if you don't want to do chickens all the time, which we're not a big chicken eating family, so we're not huge fans of chicken. Even though we got some meat birds, we're getting ready to put in the middle house. Um, so that's why we have the quail and the pheasants. It's nice to have something else. And it's hard to can a chicken, but these we can, let's see, fit five of them in a quart jar. Get them all canned up. And easy to store, easy to process, easy to raise. They're very docile. Feed conversion's pretty good on them. Overall, it's a good fit for us.
easy to process. Chickens are a lot more work. Are the lungs stuck in that one? Yeah, so sometimes the lungs stick around the inside of the rib cage. keep things moving along. As I clear a cone, I'll put another one in the cone. And these are all males. If they were females, we would of course put them in our breeder pens until the mush iron was mature. Yes, guineas are supposed to be good as they call them watchdogs. They're supposed to eat bugs and ticks and snakes and but I think mainly they just irritate the snot out of you by continually making noise. Over seemingly nothing. If they're watchdogs, they get alarmed at everything. A fallen leaf, a cat, a bird, the wind blowing, a funny looking rock. Really doesn't take much. Oh, so I got squeeze that one a little bit. I want to do this near water. Got some uh, eagle matter on there. I'm gonna rinse that off good. Make sure your hands are clean. We're doing the process. Of course, these, like I say, they're destined to be canned, so they cook it. I don't know, some of your, I don't know anything about canning, really. My wife's in charge of the canning, but I know it cooks for a very high temperature and a very high pressure for a long time, so I'm not too worried about bacteria and that sort of such thing. And with the idea of, especially as many, many, many people are into have chosen the COVID thing to go ahead and take the step into into full on homeschooling. As we've talked about doing some like formal classes on just the kind of things we do around here. Like I say just practical skills, of course more farming related than anything else, just because that's what we do here. Now this bird here my boys, I thought I processed it first, and I apologize to it because I did not want it to suffer. Um, when they caught them this morning, they were a little less, they were a little careless about setting the pen down, and this one had its leg out. And I see, I thought I processed it first because the last thing we want is anything suffering. And so, unfortunately, for a long period of time. unfortunately, it's been in there about 10 minutes and I didn't realize that. I thought I got it out first, but I grabbed the wrong bird. Because, <laughs> of course, we, we respect these animals. Everyday animals give their lives to keep us alive. And most people get, um, well, I don't say complacent. They just don't think about it because they're not exposed to it. And this is a brutal process. You know, one thing giving its life for another, and most people are separated from this to where our kids from a very young age, this was just a part of life. It's we've all very much present. Yep, we've always, um, from the time they were little, raised animals, not as pets, we do have pets, but 
most of our animals were raised particularly to feed us. And so this may be very shocking to some people, but to us it's just part of life. And of course, yes, you can just as easily go buy food at the store. But you have no idea where it lived, where it came from, what it's ate, what kind of conditions it lived in. And it's an out of sight, out of mind thing, but which we do buy food at the store. But we also choose to make this an important part of our life. I got sidetracked. So the education thing, if anybody is um, interested in something like that, we haven't really fleshed it out, it's just discussions we've had. If you have teenagers that are sitting at home doing too many video games or just kids that have never been exposed to, we call them practical skills, just how to do stuff. <laughs> how to do stuff. How to do stuff. Stuff that you're not normally exposed to, I guess. It's just part of our everyday life. Like just right now, we're clearing land. We're turning live animals into food. Get we're getting ready, ready to build. We're getting ready to build a bunch of fencing. We're doing sheetrock. What else you say? I said just getting ready for winter, like wood stacking yes, and splitting. Yes, firewood. Most people never split firewood. Most people call it chopping wood, even though we don't. Chop. That's not what we do. Um. So anyway, if this interests anybody, let us know. I am going to take the one that was injured, even though it's the last one I dispatched. We're going to process it next, just so we can kind of show what an inner injury looks like and how to deal with that on a carcass. Just an example. Everything does not always run smooth. You can see they, they set it in and actually broke it right below the joint. And I'm guessing there's going to be a pretty significant amount of bruising. On the foot in the bucket. Like winter, we're going to be course burning wood cutting wood wood's pretty much all the time going on except for the first part of the year our plan for this year was vacation but then COVID came and changed all that so uh, people ask me all the time why we burn wood um if you, any of you burn wood you already know the answer to that it's a different kind of heat good honest heat it is a lot of work my kids will probably never burn wood, I would imagine. It's been part of their lives. Their whole lives. Um, in the coming days, we don't know what's going to happen. A lot of people are scared. And it's nice to know that you can keep your family warm. Even if the heat pump doesn't turn on. Plus, heat pumps are terrible heat anyway. Alright, so... And I would imagine the same thing happens to us when we break a leg. So you get the bruising on the outside. It's already gravitating up into the thigh. Um, this is probably a bruise there from catching them because sometimes that is a challenge. And so what I'm going to do is when I get to that, I'm just going to remove that whole leg. And hunting's a big part of our life, so we'll have hunting videos, animal processing videos, hide tanning videos probably, salt curing, all kind of stuff we're gonna do in the winter. So there's just some flesh right there, so you can go behind the last rib. 
and there's nothing but a little thin skin layer. I'll just separate that. One goes out, one comes in. I'll get your scissors. 